Turn in your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8. It is the second book of the New Testament. As we get started here, uh, I got a question for you. And a, a thought just to think about. If you were to go around and you were to ask your friends to describe Jesus... I guarantee you there would be any number of different answers that you would hear. But here's my question for you. If someone came up to you and asked you, what do you think of Jesus? How would you describe him? Who is Jesus? What would you say? Is he a TV Jesus who says, if you follow me, you're going to have the life that you always wanted, you know, full of money and wealth and good health? Would he be the Hollywood Jesus, you know, that you see and uh, with the movie stars and he's mild and meek and kind and never asks us to do anything difficult? Maybe you think of Jesus as one of those magic eight balls, you know, uh, and uh, he, he's just kind of good for some quick guidance. You know, those, remember those magic eight balls? I don't know if they even still make them, but you'd kind of shake it up and you'd turn it over and in the window, it's like... Should I go into work today? And you look at that and it says, no worries. Yeah, okay. Um, Dan Brown in his book, The Da Vinci Code, maybe you read that. Or maybe you saw the movie that that book was later turned into starring Tom Hanks. Dan Brown says that Jesus is just a regular man that the church made into a miracle worker. That he really never did miracles. He really wasn't divine, at least according to Brown. A couple of weeks ago, a relative of mine posted a meme on Facebook that showed two images of Jesus. The one image was a traditional picture of Jesus, and above that image it asked, what would Jesus do? And below that it said, he would feed the hungry, and he would care for the sick, and he would shelter the homeless and love everyone. And then the second image of Jesus showed him wearing a, a flag bandana, and he had a machine gun slung over his shoulder, and he had a t-shirt on that had the Republican em, uh, elephant logo, and he had a fistful of cash. And above that image it asked, what would Republican Jesus do? And it's a slam against conservatives, of course, that said he would cut food stamp benefits and cut affordable health care and demonize the homeless and block equality rights. Let me tell you, it is a rough climate in America right now, isn't it? It's rough out there. But believe it or not, many years ago, the climate was similar. The word was out about a preacher who went around doing things that only prophets of the past had done. Lame people walked again. The dead were raised. Healings of all sorts were occurring. No one, not even his enemies, ever denied that Jesus was doing this, these things, but what they denied and questioned was, how did Jesus do these things? Some said he was a prophet of God. Some said he was doing it by the power of Satan. Others said he was the Messiah whom the Old Testament promised would, you know, eventually come and save his people. Well, today we're in Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 38 where we are challenged to be clear about who Jesus is and what that means to us. Earlier in the 8th chapter of Mark, Jesus provides food for 4,000 hungry people and he restores the sight of a blind man. Word continues to spread as Jesus and his disciples leave Galilee and then there's this very defining moment in his ministry where Jesus clarifies in clear, stark language who he is and what that means to people who will follow after him. Look at Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 29. It says, Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. And on the way he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and still others say one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? And Peter, who usually gets it wrong or says the wrong thing, he gets it right for once, and he answers, you are the Messiah. 
here we learn something very significant about who Jesus is. He is the Messiah, the Christ. This was about midway through the three-year ministry of Jesus. He's alone with his disciples, and he decides to evaluate where they've been and where they're headed. And so he asks the guys that he, you know, he's with, he, he just asks them, what are people saying about me? And some of the disciples, they spoke up and, and claimed that people were saying Jesus was John the Baptist, and others were saying, no, he's Elijah, and others were saying, no, he's one of the other prophets. And they probably had a good laugh over all the different answers that were out there. But then Jesus asked, who do you say I am? And all of a sudden the laughter stops and it gets real serious. And that's when Peter says, you are the Messiah. That title, Messiah, is the Hebrew term for the God-man Savior who would come to save the people from their sins and the enemies of God. The title Christ is the Greek term equivalent for Messiah. Messiah or Christ, it means anointed one. In reference to the one whom God would send to save his people. Now, to be recognized as Messiah or Christ and to accept that title, that is pretty significant, in case you didn't know. <laughs> it is pretty significant. And here's what that means. Jesus... He never claimed to just be a way to God. He says he is the only way to God. And in John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, if you're going to be clear about who Jesus is, you must understand that he is the Messiah and he is the only way to God. No matter what they say out there. And I think right now, Jesus is asking you and me, who do you say that I am? You see, it's not enough to say, well, my parents say that you're the Son of God, or my preacher says you're the only way to heaven. You've got to answer that question for yourself. Have you believed and confessed that Jesus is Lord? Because in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, the Bible says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. And since the beginning of the church in the book of Acts, the point at which new followers of Jesus made this confession was, made, was at their baptism. And in Acts chapter 2, verses 37 and 38, the people listening to Peter preach the gospel message for the very first time ever, they expressed their faith when they cried out, what must we do to be saved? And Peter says, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Messiah. He's the only one who can do that. A second very clear, stark statement Jesus made about himself is found in Mark chapter 8 verses 31 through 33. This is where we read these words. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But then Jesus took Peter aside and began to rebuke him. He said to his disciples, Get behind me, Satan! He said, you do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. I heard about a lady who went to buy a rosary, but she didn't want the cross attached to it. She said, it's for my friend. She doesn't like the cross. She thinks it's cruel. <laughs> I'm thinking, well, yeah, it is. But you know what? There are many people today who would take the cross out of Christianity. Peter felt the same way. He recognized who Jesus was, but he didn't want to accept what Jesus had come to do. And like so many of us, Peter wanted Jesus to do what he wanted Jesus to do. Here we learn something very significant about what Jesus does. Jesus lived to die for your sins. See, the disciples were horrified about the thought that their Redeemer would suffer and be put to death. And Jesus then gathered all his disciples around him and he said, 
the Son of Man will be rejected. The Son of Man must be killed. In other words, the cross stands at the very center of the Christian faith. Without it, Jesus would not be the Messiah. Without it, Jesus could not take away the sins of the world. 700 years before Jesus was born, Isaiah 53, verses 2 through 6, describes what Jesus did for you and me so that our sins could be forgiven and our guilt could be wiped away. This is what Isaiah said. Jesus had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, and yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. That's talking about Jesus. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Sin is a very real fact. I mean, think about this. Why did government spend millions of dollars on police and courts and prisons and militaries? The answer is sin. It's the deepest problem of the human race. It is our sins of pride and greed. It's our sins of hatred and cowardice and jealousy and dishonesty. It's our sins of selfishness and immorality and betraying God, which were responsible for his death on the cross. We are trapped by sin and we cannot free ourselves. So God took pity on us and he sent his son into our world. Because Jesus was both human and divine, he is the only one who could pay the price to God the Father on our behalf and restore us back to him. Through his sacrifice on Calvary, Jesus offers us grace and strength and peace. He lived to die for our sins, and all we have to do is accept it. A third very clear statement about Jesus is found in Mark chapter 8, verses 34 through 37. There we read these words. Then he, referring to Jesus, called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world? yet forfeit their soul. What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Wow, those are some deep, tough questions. To follow Jesus means that where he leads, you go. You know, when my kids were young, we'd play in the snow. And sometimes I'd look behind me and I'd see them stepping in my footprints. And just to joke around with them, you know, I'd start goofing around and taking giant steps and going around in circles and they'd start laughing and they'd, you know, they'd try to match my steps. By the way, moms and dads and grandparents, do you realize you're making tracks for your kids, for your children? They're going to walk in your footsteps. Make sure your footsteps are going in the right direction. Following Jesus means to walk in his footsteps. Here we learn something very significant about how we should live in response to who Jesus is. When you're in love with Jesus, all of your life revolves around him. It means you are choosing to obey God in every area. What does that mean? It means if you claim to be a Christian, now all of your interests are to be connected in some way to Jesus. Jesus gives us identity and he becomes the lens through which we see the world. If you're a Christian, you're a Christian above all else. He defines who you are and what you do. If you're a male, you are a man of Christ. If you're a female, you are a woman in Christ. 
whatever race you are, white, black, Asian, Hispanic, Native American, if you are a follower of Jesus, then you're a black follower of Jesus or a white follower of Jesus or an Asian follower of Jesus. We are Christians. We live for Jesus. He is the one who defines us and we are to imitate him. Now when a Christian becomes a plumber or an electrician or a factory worker, they are a Christian plumber, a Christian electrician, and a Christian factory worker. When a Christian becomes a police officer or a lawyer or a business person or a social worker or a baker, <laughs> they are a Christian police officer, lawyer, business person, social worker, and baker. When a family passes up the opportunity to buy a larger house or a brand new car in order to devote more of their financial blessings to God's work, they are identifying their money with God's purpose. When a couple honors God in their physical relationship prior to marriage by staying pure, they are identifying their relationship by Jesus. You see, Jesus makes all the difference, doesn't he? When the Christian who is single chooses to be happy and fulfilled as a single person and continues to serve the Lord with their life, they are identifying themselves by Christ. When the poor are cared for and the elderly are visited in the nursing home, this is identifying your life by Jesus. When the same-sex attracted person identifies him or herself and their actions by Jesus rather than their sexuality and remains celibate, they are putting Christ first. When Christians are mocked because they believe the biblical principles that lead to a flourishing life, that they still matter, that's identifying yourself by Christ. When you log onto your computer and you refuse to go to unsavory sites, you are identifying your computer use by Jesus. You see, we live the way we do as followers of Jesus because when you're in love with Jesus, all of your life revolves around him. Does your life revolve around him. Last week, Ginny Caesar shared a story with me on Facebook about a wealthy man and his son who loved to collect rare works of art. If you were in the Wednesday Bible study, you heard this story. They had everything in their collection, this father and this son, from Picasso to Raphael. They would often sit together and admire the great works of art that they had collected. But when the Vietnam conflict broke out in the late 60s and early 70s, the son went off to war. He was very courageous and he died in battle while rescuing another soldier. The father was notified and greatly and deeply grieved his only son. About a month later, just before Christmas, there was a knock on the door. The young man stood there with a large package in his hands and he said, Sir, you don't know me but I am the soldier for whom your son gave his life. He was carrying me to safety when he got shot through the heart with a bullet and he died instantly. He often talked about you and he talked about your love for art. And the young man held out his package to the dad and he said, I know that this isn't much. I'm not even really a great artist, but I wanted you to have this. The father opened the package and it was a portrait of his son painted by that young man. And the father stared in awe at the way the soldier had captured the personality of his son in that painting. The father was so drawn to the eyes that tears welled up in his own eyes. He thanked the young man. He offered to pay him for the picture. Oh no, sir, he said, I could never repay what your son did for me. This is my gift to you. Well, the father hung that portrait over his mantle. And every time visitors came to his home, he took them to see the portrait of his son before he showed them all of these other great classic works that he had collected through the years. Well, the man died a few months later, and there was to be a great auction of his painting. Many influential people gathered together. They were excited to see these great paintings and having an opportunity maybe to purchase one for their own collection on the platform, first off, right out the gate, sat the painting of the sun. And the auctioneer, he pounded his gavel. We will start the bidding with the picture of this sun. Who will bid for this picture? And there was silence. Then a voice in the back of the room shouted, we want to see the famous painting. Skip this one. We don't want this. 
but the auctioneer persisted. Will somebody bid for this painting? Who will start the bidding? $100, $200. Another voice angrily says, we don't want that painting. We came to see the Van Goghs. We came to see the Rembrandts. Get on with the real sale. But still the auctioneer continued, the sun, who will take the sun? Finally a voice came from the very back of the room. And it was the longtime gardener of that man and his son. He said, I'll give $10 for the painting. He was poor. You see, he didn't have that much money. It was all he could afford. And the auctioneer says, we have $10. Who will build, bid 20 And they're saying, give it to him for $10. We want to see the masters. And the crowd was becoming angry. They didn't want this picture of the sun. They wanted the more worthy investments for their collections. And so the auctioneer pounded the gavel. Go on once. Twice. Sold for $10. And a man sitting in the second row, he shouts, let's get on with the collection. And the auctioneer lays down his gavel at that point. He says, folks, I'm sorry, but this sale is over. What about all the other paintings? He says, I'm sorry. When I was called to conduct this auction, I was told of a secret stipulation in the will that I was not allowed to reveal until this very point. Only the painting of the sun will be auctioned. Whoever buys that painting inherits the entire estate, including all those other paintings, because you see, the one who takes the sun gets everything. 2,000 years ago, God gave his son to die on the cross. Much like the auctioneer, his message to us today is the sun. The sun. Who will take the sun? Because whoever takes the sun gets everything. What is your most precious, prized possession today? Make sure it's Jesus and your relationship with him. Because you can have everything this world has to offer right now. But if you don't have Jesus, you will end up with nothing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now and our hearts are stricken with the truth of your word that reminds us of who Jesus is and what he did. That he came to give us the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. But we know that you being a gentleman, you do not force yourselves upon us. And so, Lord, we just, we recognize right now that there is a response required on our behalf. How will we respond to the Son who gave his life for all? For each person here today, may they go forth with your blessing and your favor on their lives. But may we, most of all, leave this room a changed person, different from when we came in, because we've been exposed to your supper and your word and your praise. We believe. Help our unbelief. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Tell